When you support your local PBS station, you help make programs like this one possible. I thought there would be. No, sir. That said, for families it's hard. And we go away, the crew goes away for uh, fairly long periods of time, and they, they leave loved ones, families, kids at home, and that takes some adjusting. But that part of it doesn't get any easier. Liberty has expired for all hands. You need to be on board at this time. I love you! We're ready to go. All right. Ready to do our country's business. in the entire world. It just becomes like a small town. It just happens to be floating on the water, happens to be, you know, 1,092 feet long and headed towards the Persian Gulf. The whole ship blows my mind. It's so big. Every day I'm finding, because I'm lost, I'm finding a new compartment or a new little shop that I didn't know we had. The first month is just trying to figure out where's my rack, where I'm supposed to go, what's supposed to happen on a daily basis. This is an extraordinary environment. We live beneath the runway of a major airport. We live on top of an ammo dump that has enough ammunition to do a significant amount of damage. I never did that in my civilian ministry. My biggest risk in my civilian ministry was falling out of my swivel chair at my desk. I have 
have to deal with 5,200 different personalities each day. Probably the closest thing that a person who is not in prison will ever get to be in prison. <laughs> Exciting, fast paced, fast moving, and stressful. The whole ship exists so that I can go off the end and go fly. All of the departments are vital to make a jet flying off the carrier and put a piece of precision ordnance onto a target as per national tasking. Without one department, without religious ministries, without the legal department, without the reactor department, without supply department, without hot water, cold water, and steam for the catapults, none of it works. You have some of the best of the best and the worst of the worst. You meet them all, and some of them become your best friends, and some of them become your worst enemies. It'll be long, and it'll be hot, and it'll be hard. There will most assuredly be stories to tell. All right, that's it. Nimitz on three. One, two, three. The Nimitz stands for never imagine myself in this zoo. First of all, I want to say welcome aboard back to the air wing. It's great to have the mess back together. It's great to be going west. There are lots of strong emotions out there uh, throughout the world about the United States and about Americans and about the things we're doing and what we believe in and, and how we do them. We want our friends to think we're their best friends. We want our enemies to believe that we're their worst nightmare. But to do that, we have to set the right tone and we have to set it every time. And I need your buy-in and your talent on this issue to make this work, okay? It's like anything else we do in the Navy, it's the Chief's mess that's gonna get it done. So thanks again for everything so far. We're off on a great deployment, and we'll sure see you about the ship. Chiefs, they're the backbone of the Navy. We're middle management, we get things done. The officers' jobs are essentially to think great thoughts and then to say, this is what I want done and then to tell the chiefs, and they're the ones that actually go and get it done. You know, they've been in the military for so long that they're very stern about things. They're very, let's get it done, Yankee Doodle Dandy, stuff like that. They're just very, you know, I can make them laugh and stuff like that, but it's hard. It's, it's, a, it's a challenge to make a chief laugh. We are dead serious. If I tell your puppy dog gonna pull a freight train, don't ask how, just hook him up. <laughs> okay, it's going down. And the example that you set in this CPO mess, we don't have to do a whole lot of talking on the deck plates because they will see your action. That's all I'm saying. I'm going to end on that note right there. All right? Thank you for attending. Happy deployment. There's nothing new under the sun now. But not to worry, because we'll make it somehow. Because it's never enough. It's never enough. Rushing in, running out. Roll out the point is the first thing I do is boom, right there. The sailor's creed, get the charge up. I got it, I'm gone. My name is uh, Command Master Chief, Aviation Warfare, Surface Warfare, Christopher Lawrence Penton. 2,900 enlisted sailors on board, and I'm the senior enlisted from Bogalusa, Louisiana. Never ever thought but the chief would be newsworthy. We only have 12 aircraft carriers in the United States Navy. We only have 10 nuclear aircraft carriers, not in the United States Navy, but in the entire world. And to be the command master chief of one of the of one of 10 is the, is, is the ultimate. To quote Mr. Rogers, but I'm not putting my slippers on, I put my shoes on. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. 
It takes a positive person to become a master chief. They're gonna put a sweater on. Now we talking about a command master chief, then you have to have, then that's a whole different layer. So you got to have the passion, you got to have the heart, and you got to have the mindset. But above all, you got to have the energy. Hey, what you guys doing? And no, 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 cleaning station. You're not in your rack at eight. Let, let's get busy. Let's get busy. The command master chief, I think his name's Christopher L. Penton. He's the senior most master chief. He's gonna love seeing my hair like this. The CMC is intimidating and scary, and I don't like to talk to him unless I have to. <laughs> what are you doing, Jim? Are you cleaning or what? I'm walking around with a cup of coffee. What, what, which one are you doing? Investigate the burly, Master Chief. Make sure everything's going well. Investigate with an open container there, shit, mate. Yes, Master Chief. Master Chief's something pretty unique. I mean, this is someone who has given 20 years in the Navy, but more than that, has given 20 hard charging years. Hey, Jim, where all this, where all this stuff come from? You don't make eight promotion cycles, which is what it takes to go from E1 to E9, without pretty much waking up every day and saying, I'm going to go out and kick a little ass. Alvin never stand up there with a gun in his hand. Can you see him? They came here because they just popped positive for drugs. Alvin never just pulled a trigger on him. Boom! All you young people. Boom! <laughs> You know, sometimes as officers, we want to give a little room for error. It isn't that way with him. This is what he thinks. He's direct. He's blunt. All right, there, Chef, man, let's talk about some of the personal things that may derail your career. If you go out here and you don't practice safe sex, there's three things that's going to happen. What are they? There's diseases. Yeah, there's diseases. Uh, pregnancies. Pregnancy. Um, and then you can get the big one. You can get the death sentence, which is what? Rape. HIV. HIV. Come on out, follow the lead. I mean, follow the script. <laughs> the, uh, so I just, yeah. <laughs> Why is that the, the majority of the young people that join the Navy today, they join for structure. They join for discipline. And they join for, uh, to, to have responsibilities. And I'm gonna make sure that you get a, a heavy dosage of all of that every day. probably would be dead or in jail or something. I joined the Navy so I could just become a man, grow up, because where, where, where I grew up at, I was going nowhere. My dad had always said, you know, you need to do something, you've been out of high school a year. On the Navy website, filled out a couple surveys on it, and then basically took my ass to the recruiter. Is it hot up there today? My parents, they, they didn't even know I did it. I was being sarcastic, actually. I came in one night and I said, Oh, I went and talked to the recruiter today. I'm leaving in two months. I'm Airman Christopher Altus, I'm E3, and I'm from uh, Manassas, Virginia. I'm 21 years old. See you up there. What do I have to do today? Stand here and fry and arm up jets. And they take off and de-arm them when they're recovering. That's that's what I do all day. Yeah. I wanted to go to college. All my friends often went to college, and mainly it was the money. You know, middle class, we had a little brother and sister. My parents pretty much told me, look, you're going to have to either get a scholarship or, you know, and that's when the military came in a question, look, they'll pay for your school, you know? Marines and Army, I threw out right away. I'm not that kind of person, you know, with a gun and going out on the field and, you know, whatever. I heard all the stories, you know, about pulling into port. Mainly it was the travel, the Navy for the travel, because I knew boats hit ports. 
I'd much rather be at a college right now in some fraternity just partying it up. And it's the other way around, you know? I'm already three years into it, and I've been all around the world. It seems that I've grown up a lot, but I mean, I still feel, still feel like a kid inside, you know? And when you think about how many people, over 5,000 people, making a ship work, all I am is one pilot flying a single seat jet. I go up there, my jet's ready, I get it, and I fly away. Think about the guys that are, that are making it fly. It's, it's unbelievable, this, the amount of knowledge that an 18-year-old seaman can perform at, at, at this level of, of heat, of stress, first time away from home. Uh, it's, the respect I have for them is unbelievable. I don't know what McDonald's pays per hour, but let's say it's seven bucks an hour, six bucks an hour. We're paying a lot less than that when we're at sea. Because if you figure these kids are working 16, 18 hour days, at least of which they're committed to staying on board the other eight unless they're a great swimmer, we're paying you know, not seven dollars an hour. I don't think too many of these kids came out of Philip Exeter Academy and said, hey, I think I'm gonna go join the Navy for an enlistment for four to six years. So they're not rich kids. I mean, they're middle class and lower middle class. And, uh, and poor. If you want to win something such as ice, then you might get a little more. At least something better than a little stuff you had before. No need to cry or walk away in disgrace. Cause you gotta be tough and do to get first place. Since it's only the best kid ever take that space. So suck up the pain and put on your game face. The high school aspect out here is strong. Uh, you gotta figure most of the people out here are 18, 19, 20 years old. So suck up the pain and put on your game face. Put on the floor that you don't want to go home. It just takes a little bit for everything. Drama. School is drama. Always something. Basically what it is, a big ass floating high school. You know, there's the gossip in the hallways, you know, so-and-so hooked up with so-and-so, and they're going to be doing this and that. And, you know, you still got the testing going on. And one last question. Uh, who's the Secretary of Defense? Secretary of Defense. is Carnalingus rights. And we get treated like children. Shower, shower, shower. Brush your teeth. Do what you gotta do. Don't be nasty, all right? It's not that hard. Your mom's not here to clean up after you, and no one else is gonna clean up, clean up after you, so clean up after yourself. Have your stuff nicely stowed away. Okay, one yeah. stuffed animal. Okay. Only one. I'm gonna allow oh, one sweet. out, and that's it. It is a big high school. It's high school drama. People complain about the littlest things. It's a simple noise factor. This morning, I heard it a lot from the, you who's getting up this morning by our, our one of the, Go ahead. Put the, the, the thing where the lock is. Yeah, clank, yeah. Clank, I heard clank, that one this morning. Jesus, so you have to be careful with your rag. I mean, just hold it and put it down. You know what I mean? It slams so much. Like, okay, it's well, loud. Um, that might have been me, but it's like probably. a problem. Uh, it's a problem with my rack, and I'm gonna close my rack. It's not. But it's, it, it shouldn't be like. You know, you're such a light sleeper or whatever. I have a problem with my rack, and if it's a problem, she just really come does. out and stay. I'm not saying she has to stomp on her. No, I'm just saying. No, I'm just saying. I mean, it's not gonna be totally quiet in here. You know, I try, but ladies, is that it? I guess that's it. So everybody, I guess, do that work. Go back to see. I'll go back to doing what you gotta do. All right, good night. This first birthing meeting, I don't know what to say. I gotta get used to the new birthing I'm in or whatever. Um, there's new rules. It's kind of tough, but I gotta get over it. <laughs> you, you gotta do what you gotta do, because they, they're not concerned. I am Airman Shanika McCree. I've been in the Navy three years now, and this is my second deployment on the USS Nimitz. 206. I work in primary flight control, kind of like an air traffic controller. We're keeping track of the aircrafts that leave off deck and come on deck. Mode 1 Alpha, stand by. 304 on deck. You got 10 standby. Mode 1 Alpha, stand by. 304 on deck. You got chocks still in there. We still got chocks. He said he's good to go. No chance. No chance, paddles. No chance. Two harness up, Primary flight control, it's a privilege. And working up on the air boss and the mini boss, that's a big thing around here. What's the matter? 
Two the people ran after the two wire. This is gonna. I'm gonna go break some of these. One zero two. Horn it up, Wayne. Growing up in Athens, Georgia, I didn't really think there was a lot of opportunities. My parents were into drugs. My dad was like a pimp or something, and my mother, she was, she had become a prostitute. In my family, everybody was young when they started having kids. And I was 16, and I got past that point. I didn't have any kids. So I got to 18, and things started getting hard for me. And I was just like, I don't want to fall. I've come this far. I don't want to fall. Turn them off the golden ring. Thanks. Well, I'm about to go on the ledge. My grandma played a very big role in my life. I prayed to her every night. I'd say, God, just tell my grandmother I said hi. And she made the comment, I think you should join the Navy. And I was thinking the same thing, because I wanted to get money for school. This deployment, from my understanding, is we're relieving the USS Carl Vinson. And we're in Operation Iraqi Freedom. That's all I know. <laughs> I just know I'm going to the Persian Gulf. The Nimitz class aircraft carrier is the most powerful weapon ever designed. With our 60 to 70 strike aircraft, those aircraft will go out, apply their 500, 1,000, or 2,000 pound bombs, recover, reload, refuel, relaunch, and go do it again and again and again. And there's nothing like it. The aircraft carrier's plan is to uh, Head west, it's either going to go to the Persian Gulf, it's going to go to the Korean area, or it's going to go to the Taiwan Chinese area for national command execution of whatever. Right now, I think the plan is to continue to head uh, west to go towards the Persian Gulf. Everybody thinks about Iraq, and everybody thinks that's where we're headed. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if that's not where we end up. Uh, you never know um, what could happen in the world. Um, we are kind of just forward deployed. So we're at the whim of the CNO and the president. USS Nimitz and aircraft carriers in general are very definitely instruments of national diplomacy. Where we go is determined in many cases at very high levels of our government. It's almost like a bumper sticker that anytime there's a national crisis, the president comes into the war room and says, where are the aircraft carriers? Hey, Nav. Uh, all good water to starboard, right? My name is Ted Branch. I'm the captain of the Nimitz. I grew up on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, close to the ocean. I'd go down and watch the ocean a lot. And you'd see ships come and go. And you'd think about what they were going to do and where they were going to go. No, this guy's not one for five. I'm looking at it. My dad was in the Navy Reserve. And when I was in the seventh grade, the whole family went to Annapolis during his training duty. And that summer before my seventh grade year, I thought it was an easy thing since sliced bread. What speed do you have for the, uh, the outbound merchant in front of us? There's something mystical about the sea and about travel and, and the Navy. To me, it's always been that spirit of adventure and what's over the horizon. Occasionally, we'll, we'll take off for the other side of the world, and we won't know exactly what we're going to encounter. So some of that adventure is still out there. Matt, let's go ahead and go to 15 knots. All that standard at K075 RPM. All that standard K075 RPM line. My job is to make sure the ship is ready materially and the crew is ready uh, physically and mentally. It's the best job in the Navy, and I am responsible for uh, everything. On three. One, two, three. <laughs> we didn't sell these in the ship. <laughs> <laughs> Really, when we're together as the city at sea, as 5,000 folks at sea, I guess you'd call me the mayor. A ship's a ship, and it is a, a fine ship, a great one. But the heart and the soul is not the steel, it's the crew. Good morning on Nimitz. This is the XO. It's time for cleaning stations. Let's all hands get out and about and clean up the ship. Get the uh, music on, the TVs on. Good morning. All the uh, messing facilities and gym equipment will be closed. Cleaning stations, everybody's favorite time of the day. That is all. All right, guys, let's go. Cleaning stations. Just another day. 
cleaning stations is basically just when you clean the ship. You sweep and you polish the same spot over and over again. And, you know, the XO gets on, he's like, now let's get the radios on, the TV's going, it's cleaning stations. And he gets all excited about it, I don't know why. Even if something's totally clear and polished, you can see yourself in it and the future. They make you polish it over again. You just have to keep sitting there and rubbing and rubbing and rubbing. Believe it or not, cleaning stations are what makes us a good warrior. It's good for morale, and that morale leads to us being ready to go and fight a war. So with that, let's get ready to go to battle in Iraq and kill some terrorists, all right? My name's Christian Garzon. I'm from uh, upstate New York, the real New York. Upstate, that's what the U sign. I'm an undesignated airman, meaning that uh, I was just kind of brought here and thrown wherever they wanted me. That was probably the like, least likely person to join the military out of all my friends. When I first told them that, they're like, <laughs> they couldn't believe it. I come from a middle class family. We had two cars, a garage. I went to school in London. I try to read like a book a month, sometimes two if I can. Uh, how's the coffee doing? I don't know, check it. The election of George W. Bush was something, uh, of course, I took part in. I am a Republican, so I voted for George Bush. You want me to get more food? You just spent... Murphy, you just spent $16 in the store. Um, you know, at the time the war on terrorism was going on, everyone felt an increased sense of uh, patriotism, I guess. You need anything, sir? Coffee or anything? Huh? You need any coffee or anything, sir? All right. And, you know, you get that feeling, and you're just like, you know, I should do something. And, you know, it's going to benefit me in the future. It's going to look good on a job resume. And I just, I went ahead and I, I, I enlisted. Just accelerating my life. Yeah, what's up? Honestly, I don't really think of it as being the military. Because I just look at it as like a normal job, really. I go to work. You know, I have a nice place up forward on the ship, like a shelf in the wall. This is where I sleep at. And, you know, it, these racks are very convenient uh, for the military. After a while, I get used to this. Most people aren't this good first time around. But anyway, you can, you can pretty much stay in one position all night and be pretty comfortable. The military men are very about being here and loving every second of it. I do like it, but I don't love it. I don't wake up every day and say, you know, you know bark like a dog. Like, oof, oof, and, jump out of bed and, you know, put my dog tags on and, you know, go run two miles. Some people like that. I don't. Raw? Yes. All right, Christian Garzon here. We're actually live in a bathroom, or as the Navy likes to call it, it's called a head. I take my camera around once in a while, and I do interviews with people to see, you know, what, what the real Navy life is like. Excuse me, sir? Hello. How are, how are you? You got quick time for an interview? What's, Hold on. Hey, open up real quick. Oh, yes, sir. Do this take a second of your time? What's going on? Um. Painters paint, writers write. I just, I film. This ship is a floating piece of, of America. We have all the fine delicacies in terms of candy from back home. Richie, what are your goals for the future? What are my goals? Yeah. So what do you guys think of the ship? The ship, uh, the ship is kind of, ship, ship life is kind of harsh. Because well, the food's awesome. Nah. People are so lame, dude. Me mm. still might have a pulse. All right, killer, you're up. Give me two more. What's on the agenda for tomorrow? You got any new plans? Anything tomorrow. like that? No, just wake up and do the same thing. And so every time the alarm goes off, I say, fuck, I woke up. I can't even lift that back here. Can you pick it up? Thanks. My name is Cindy Costa. I'm from Sacramento, California. I'm a seaman recruit, E1. I'm a CS, culinary specialist. It sucks being a CS. You have to feed 5,000 people. Hold on. Ah. 
people don't appreciate you and they just take more than they can eat and you end up working harder. The recruiter asked me what I wanted to do with my life and I told him I wanted to be a chef. And he told me he used to be a chef and that the Navy has a good culinary program. Today I made 25 boxes of chicken wellington, 10 or so boxes of pork chops. It's a trial. It's a lot of hard work. Long, long hours. No, scrub it clean. Get it out. You're not leaving until you're done. And your supervisors treat you like crap sometimes. Go ahead and drain it, fill it up, everything. Same an apprentice cost us. has potential to be a really good worker. She needs a lot of work, a lot of self-discipline. Seems like she wants to scam around things, a responsibility. And I'm not trying to sound sexist or anything, but yeah. Girls are lesser than everything else. Yeah, pretty much they can, I can't, I can't, I can't lift it, no. Tough shit, shit, mate, yeah. I'm trying to train you actually to be a good worker. Okay. A good worker, not a skater, not a smoker. All I have to do is put the cheese in, and I'm out. You just no. said potato. No, I said the rest. Hey! I have a steady job, and I'm 19 years old, and most 19-year-olds are working at McDonald's. But some, some things I'm not, like, I do get sad sometimes, depressed, you know? I don't want to be a quitter, but I really would rather be home. The minute you get on this boat, your life stops and you're out here to do one thing and one thing only, and that's work and eat and sleep. You go back six months later, everyone else is six months ahead of you. Going away for six months and being in a relationship, you know, it's, that's hard. I've never really had a steady girlfriend. And I always like girls that end it with like E, like Jamie or a Katie or a Brittany. And for some reason, uh, Tanya's not one of them. <laughs> She's a A, Tanya. I'm a drive-through junkie. So every night after work, I used to just go through the drive-thru. You know, I had McDonald's, Taco Bell, or Jack in the Box. So I, I'm going through the drive-thru one night, and there's this girl working there. And one of my buddies worked there, too. So I was like, Joe, I'm like, what's up with her? You know, how old is she? What's her name? And he tells me, Tanya. This is Tanya. It's her sister. So every night after work, I used to just go through the drive-thru. One night, she asked me if I needed anything else, and as she was handing me my bag. She's like, ketchup? And I was like, yeah. And then I was like, how about your number? <laughs> just something cheesy like that. She wouldn't give it to me. She just smiled, and she didn't give it to me. Probably about a month of coercing her, she finally gave in, I guess, to his wit, or maybe his charm or looks. I don't know. That's cute. That was it. We started seeing each other. I was so surprised. I was like, wow, this girl actually likes me. Cool. Hey, what are you doing? Laying down. Laying down. It all led up to this one night where she came in the bedroom and I was sitting there. And she had some snacks and a Ziploc bag. And I, I made some kind of joke. I was like, I look like a pregnant girl eating snacks like that this late at night out of a bag, carrying it around or something like that. And she just started blushing. And then immediately I knew. So is the baby still doing jumping jacks? It hurts. Like, like. I don't know what she's doing, like sticking her arm out or something. <laughs> it's mostly like, okay, well, you're pregnant. Things happen for a reason. We're not gonna take the easy way out and just getting rid of it. Uh, that, that doesn't fly well with me at all. Bye. Um, bye.
Keep your hat on all the way up to, to you sat down in the, in, in the chair there. Hey, Billy D. It don't seem like it seemed like you didn't quite get the chemicals they uh, they had deactivated. Oh God, you should have had a haircut a long time ago. Yeah, I don't know how you thought that was gonna fly on a six-month deployment. That's all right. We'll hook you up. We'll we'll, we'll put you back in the game again. <laughs> I gotta come up here every week and get a and get a haircut. Oh man, overboard. On board Nimitz is the XO. We have a report of a chem light in the water. We need all hands to uh, to go to muster. All hands to muster, please. Get the lights on the birthing areas, get your shipmates out of the rack. All hands uh, swiftly and safely That's to good. muster. Thank you. some kind of indication that something is not right. All the personnel on the flight deck and, and the sponsons wear chem lights at night, so when you see a chem light in the water, there's a possibility that somebody fell over. At nighttime is when we have the most man overboards. We're talking about falling 90 feet. It may knock the wind out of you. It may even knock you out. Anyone see Stewart, Monson, or Bastable? All ops is good. Here's the bridge. Smith is, I think Smith is on watch. This is the main hub. The executive officer runs this evolution down here, and we plot every department. We got so many departments on board, got so many squadrons, and once we figure out if we have everybody on board, then we secure from the drill. If not, we start launching helicopters and light bulbs. pretty so I don't know if we can even go live it's been plenty long enough for him to get down here it's been plenty I can get anywhere on this ship in about two and a half minutes Chuck do, do we know where he is well he needs to be here Okay, I'm wasting my time. I've had it. Stand by for words between the officers. Air wing 11. All right, this is the deal. 
There are two possible situations that just could have happened. One is a chem light accidentally got in the water. One is some son of a bitch threw a chem light in the water. Now, if somebody accidentally throws a chem light in the water, call the bridge, no harm, no foul. We won't call away a man overboard. Innocent mistakes don't get punished. When we find somebody that's throwing these things in the water maliciously, and we're going to find them because somebody in this great crew is going to see it happen and is going to sit on them, I'm going to hang your ass out to dry, and you're going to regret the day you were born. So just keep it up, pal, and we'll see what happens from there. That is all. <laughs> warfighting culture, we have to be able to depend on each other at all times to, to follow the rules. You're not going to get away with a whole lot in the Navy, not nearly as much as you would in the civilian world. When you do something very small, you're in trouble big. Do address these people by sir, chief, whoever addresses you. If you do not address them by their rank, I give you one warning. After that one warning, I will put you in handcuffs. I can do it one of two ways. I can slam you to the deck, or I can do it nicely. Do you understand? One step back, march. Uncover. Two. You get called possession of alcohol? Yes, Master Chief. Excuse me? Yes, Master Chief. Okay. You either drink a hell of a lot or you get called a lot. Which is it? I get caught a lot, Master Chief. That's what I would say. But, uh, these laws are not so you can just stand in front of me, it, so we can make it painful enough so you don't do it twice. And we're gonna do that. I mean, it's gonna be, it's gonna be rough. You're gonna be looking at water for a very, very long time. Okay, Airman Pierpoint, at this time, uh, the intent here is to protect yourself, and I wanna protect my shipmates. So I want you to be on this ship 45 days. I want you to have extra duty for 45 days. That's what we recommend. We'll have the XO, you know, talk to him, and we'll see what goes from there. You understand that? Yes, Master Chief. Cover. Two. One step forward. March. OK, you've done something wrong. There is a cost to you for disobeying the rules. But you're not a bad person. You're not a bad sailor. We still want you in the company. It's a big deal, but I mean, I did it, so I have to deal with it. That's the only way to look at it. Maybe I'll learn something out of it. <laughs> I lived at the same town my whole life. Uh, there's only like 3,000 people in it. I lived with my dad after I graduated high school. Left for the Navy a month later. Sleeping. I got 45 days restriction, 45 days extra duty. They're taking half my pay for two months, but they didn't knock me down. They didn't take no stripes. Well, that's better than it could have been, Bob. I know, like they gave me a suspended bust, which is like if I get in trouble, yeah. uh, then they're gonna knock me down. Well, that's cool. Yes. That's great. So I just have to stay on the boat. I get off restriction June 30th, so I have to stay on the boat till June 30th. Yeah. I got to muster. When we're in port, I have to muster at 5.30. I have to muster at 5.30 in the morning. I have to muster at 4 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and 9.30 at night, 4 yeah. And then when we're out to sea, I have to muster at 7. Like and I have to do two hours extra yeah, duty. Yeah. And I have to go to AA classes. Well, All right, I love you, pal. It'll be okay. We'll get through it. I love you. All right, I love you, Daddy. I love you too, baby girl. All right. Bye-bye, honey. Bye. I have no idea what I want to do with my life. I love my job. I love people I work with. Two years ago, people were like, you're going to have a job that you 
push missiles around and you build bombs and you do all this stuff that is so dangerous. You get used to it. You like, yeah, this is my job. This is this is what I support. This is what I chose to do for my country. And like, it's not it's not a big deal. I I don't push the button to drop the missile. I just send it up, and that what my country decides to do with it is is what I'm here for. I'm also at the bottom of the food chain on the boat, and you don't know what the mission is going to be, but I still do it because that's what I'm told to do. We had our onload. We had an onload of ordnance on that lasted like three days. We were getting bombs from uh, Iraqi Freedom. And, you know, some writing was still on the bombs like, take this Saddam or this is for my brother. Wow, I just, I would stare at these bombs just coming in, looking at the writing that I had on it. I'm like, oh my God, this, you know, people actually thought this was going to drop and they're probably hoping it did and it's here on our on our boat and I'm just like wow this 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 could have killed somebody it's it's a weird feeling it would be hard to not be patriotic and be in this job because you do the president's bidding and the country's bidding and so if you don't believe in what you're doing I think it probably makes it pretty hard I think all of us have uh, different opinions. I think not a lot of us discuss it. I'm trying to think, are we doing the right thing or are we doing the wrong thing? That's a personal struggle that I think anybody that does this, anybody that's over there pulling the trigger or doing that, has to ask themselves that question at some point. Even though I'm not physically pushing the button and dropping the bombs, I am part of this circle. I was naive when I first joined. I never thought we'd go to war. Sometimes I would show to join the Peace Corps. Personally, I don't even get the war. Okay, the Twin Tower, I guess. If we're fighting back for that reason, yeah, I get it. But I don't get why we're fighting for somebody else's freedom when we barely have our own. Basically, we just fighting over control of oil. I believe in our country and I believe in our ideals and I believe that infringements on that need to be, you know, thwarted, and if force is necessary, then I'm willing to be a part of that. Hell yeah. Get some, baby! What's going on, sir? You show me how to do this. Pure and simple. Okay. If you're the ho-ho and all, once you take the safety on safe, fire until you pretty much don't want to fire anymore. Alrighty. All righty. All right, so I love you make sure they're not over eight rounds at a time. Okay. Safety and all safe. Safety is where? How about your thumb, sir? Got it? Get possibly put a baby in that car. I, that's what I'm saying, I need to get it fixed. No, I mean, you couldn't put the baby unit for us fixed. Why not? It's a two-seater. No, it's got seats in the back. Yeah, I know, it only got two doors. Chief knows Tanya's pregnant, Gunner knew, the whole shop knew. This whole time, I'm trying to figure out how to tell her dad. And I was afraid that it would get to him before I told him. From what I heard, Tanya's father's an ex-gunner. Yeah, he, he was a retired, you know, gunner. He retired lieutenant commander, and uh, so he knew everyone on the base. From our gunner, from my gunner, and if he's the same way, because most of all gunners are all the same, he better not fuck up. And it just came that one day where I was sick of going to bed every night, you know, wondering if I was going to tell him, you know, tomorrow, you know what I mean? You told him or she did? I told him. I pulled him aside. He was walking through the kitchen. And Tanya was sitting on the counter in the kitchen eating, and she just looked at me. And we just came from dinner, and I looked at her, and I was like, I got to do this right now. And she was just like, and I just followed her dad down the hallway, and I was, and I went up to him. I was like, sir, you know, can I have a word with you for a minute? And he's like, sure, you want to go? And I was like, in the garage is fine, because it was right behind him. Yeah. So we stepped out in the garage, I shut the door behind me, and uh, 
He's like, what's, he said, what's going on? I was like, well, sir, you know, I've known about this for a while and I was really just, you know, trying to find the best time to tell you this and I realized there's not gonna be one. <laughs> and I was like, oh, so here it is. I said, Tanya's pregnant. What do you say? Just complete silence, man. Complete silence, man, in my stomach. I stopped breathing, man. I was just like, <laughs> it was so quiet, I didn't even want to breathe, man. I was just like waiting to see what he was going to do, say. And he kind of kind of took a look up. He looked down, he took a deep breath. He didn't look at me, and he said, oh, I wish you guys, you know, would have been smarter. He said, how long have you known about this? And I said, sir, I've known about it for a couple weeks now. And he said, so, you know, what's your plan? I said, I don't know, sir. I, I, I got to go on cruise. I got a deployment coming up. He doesn't look like the father type, but he's like like a party guy. But maybe hopefully this will make him grow up more, I guess. Like, I think he's in for quite a wake up when this baby comes, because I don't think he realizes right now what it's, you know, what it's going to do to his life. All right, dude. All right, night. Send by for a word from the commanding officer. Good afternoon, Nimitz and Air Wing 11. Okay, tomorrow morning we'll be entering port at Pearl Harbor, and uh, there's lots of history there. It, it promises to be a great evolution and a really, uh, a really great event for, for all hands. If I were one of you guys, especially if this is my first Liberty port, I would plan to be back to the ship an hour before I'm supposed I to be hear back. From every one of you. But you promise that you're going to keep clean, not get drunk, overly drunk, come back to the ship and get in trouble. I want to hear that. I promise. All right. If you ain't ordinance, you ain't shit! I just worry. It's the longest I've ever had to be away from anyone. I mean, I'm out here for six months. Trust, you know, is a big issue now. Got a package full of wishes. I think if we can overcome this with no a secrets, machine, a it'll work out. A globe made out of gold. We are paying our honors no to over a thousand people that are entombed in the USS Arizona. December 7th, 1941. Attack on Pearl Harbor. You got it? Printed on the box I see. Acmes build a world to be. Take a chance, grab a piece. Help me to believe it. What kind of world do you want? Think it. Think. Let's start at the start. Build a master. Starts now. Should there be people or peoples? Money, funny pedestals for fools who never pay. Raise your army, choose your steeple. Shine the satellites can look the other way. They look very, very good, very impressive. Done in my job. The oceans without the salt. Let every man own his own hand. Can you dig it, baby? What kind of world do you want? Think it, think. Let's start at the start. Build a master.
about Carrier, go online to pbs.org. Thank <laughs> you.